I know everyone's got a lot of things to, to do tonight, probably. Thank you for joining us. Uh, there's a, a big game tonight as well as the Michigan-Michigan State game that's playing tonight. So for those of you that are uh, Wolverine or Spartans fans. Um, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for our 98th annual Preston M50 Memorial Lecture. Uh, for the very first time in its history, we're holding it uh, virtually with our Zoom webinar. Uh, I'd like to give a very special welcome to our attendees uh, from Northern Michigan, Western Michigan, or anyone else who would normally not attend our in-person meetings, or maybe you're joining us tonight for the very first time. Uh, it's great to have you here with us tonight. We have a great program lined up for you this evening. We will start this uh, evening off uh, with uh, two very interesting uh, resident research presentations. And then we'll conclude the evening with our keynote speaker, Dr. Gregory Nicola, with this topic of the economics of artificial intelligence. Uh, throughout this meeting, uh, there's a, a chat box available for you down there. And so you can go ahead and click on that and add any comments or uh, ask any questions, which we'll uh, collect uh, later uh, for our speakers. So with that, I first uh, would like to open the evening uh, with a very short PowerPoint uh, presentation of Dr. Uh, Preston M. Hickey, for which this uh, memorial lecture is named after. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, try to share my screen here. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. Uh, we have a picture here of uh, Dr. Hickey. And uh, again, this is the uh, 84th annual uh, Hickey lecture. Uh, I'm gonna start off with a quote uh, from, from Raymond uh, Gagliardi. Uh, he's a well-known radiologist uh, in the Detroit area. And uh, most of my information uh, of this biography is uh, from uh, Dr. Gagliardi. Um, he said, every now and then, uh, throughout human history, forces seem to come together almost accidentally to produce men and women of startling wisdom, talent, and insight, and the results are wondrous indeed. Such a man was Preston M. Hickey. Dr. Hickey was born in Ypsilanti, Michigan in December 3, 1865. Uh, he obtained his uh, Bachelor of Arts at the University of Michigan in 1888. Uh, he attended medical school in Detroit College of Medicine and, and uh, matriculated in 1892. Uh, uh, Detroit College of Medicine is uh, now known as Wayne State University. In his early years, uh, he began his career as a pathologist and otolaryngologist. Um, because of his interest in photography, he turned, uh, turned his attention to radiology, quickly realizing the possibilities uh, of x-ray medicine. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Uh, Dr. Hickey obtained one of the first pieces of commercial x-ray apparatus in Michigan uh, about 1900, and he set up a private practice at Harper University Hospital in Detroit. Uh, devoting himself full-time, uh, he was soon recognized as an expert in this new specialty. Uh, some of his professional appointments include uh, first chairman of the radio department at Harper Hospital in Detroit. Uh, he is also the professor of radiology at Detroit College of Medicine, uh, chairman and professor of radiology at University of Michigan in his formative years. Uh, he was a real pioneer in radiology. In 1904, in the Journal of Michigan Medical Society, Dr. Hickey used the term radiograph to describe images produced by x-rays. Uh, prior to this, there was no consensus and the term uh, radiograph is still used today. Uh, he's one of the founders of the American Rankin Ray Society and it's a foremost force in holding it together in its early years. And it still stands today as one of the preeminent societies in the United States. In 1906, ARS appointed Preston Hickey as president of the society and the first editor of the American Quarterly of uh, Recognology, AJR, which is still published on a monthly basis to this very day. 
In the early days, the most popular term for a specialty was scatography. Uh, this is from the Greek root defining x-rays as silhouette and pictures. Uh, through Dr. Hickey's influence, as editor of the AJR, it was possible to adopt a new term, ranchonology, as the appropriate description of our new specialty. At the time, uh, ARS was setting both ethical and professional as well as scientific standards in the specialty, and the name ranchonology was quickly accepted. He was an early advocate of standardized approach to radiology reporting. He used the term interpretation of radio gaps to define a process involving specialized knowledge wherein a differential diagnosis of the X-ray findings might lead to a conclusion based on the probabilities in the same way much a pathology report might. He was also the father of radiology templates. He promoted adoption of standardized nomenclature and standardized reports. Dr. Hickey was one of the first uh, thinking of taking oblique views. I uh, used this for localization of downhill calcifications. Uh, he suggested the linear shadows rating from the hyaluron chest films represented pulmonary vessels, which was not universally accepted at the time. Dr. Hickey was also responsible for the Hickey cone, which, at, re, which reduced scattered rays to minimum and gave finer ranking detail. He started viewing negative images directly in the view box. Uh, prior to this, radiology considered extension of photography, and negative images were printed and read as positive photographs. The efforts of Dr. Preston Hickey helped establish radiology as an independent, separate medical discipline on par with accepted clinical specialties of surgery, obstetrics, and gynecology, and internal medicine. Dr. Hickey was a driving force in establishing in 1925 the section on radiology of the American Medical Association, and he served as one of its first officers. Dr. Hickey leaves behind a lasting legacy. He was referred to by his colleagues and students as Pop Hickey, which reflects the character of his professional relationships with many. He passed away in October 30, 1930. And the Detroit X-ray Society, the predecessor of our society, MRS, decided to honor the memory of Dr. Preston Hickey by devoting the most important single scientific program of the year to him. Preston Hickey is remembered as a man who played a major role in organizing the specialty of radiology, setting its standards, defining its terms and procedures, and most important of all, establishing its place as a genuine independent medical discipline. It is uh, truly amazing and really speaks to Dr. Hickey's greatness that we are still using his accomplishments and affecting radiology to this very day, 100 years later. We owe him a great deal of gratitude. And if it were not for Dr. Hickey, uh, we would still be practicing uh, scarography instead of radiology today. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to move on to our next part of the program this evening. And we're going to go to our research presenters. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen here. And uh, first up, uh, we have uh, Dr. Zachary Beswick. Um, he's one of the two uh, 2021 abstract winners from the 24th annual resident and fellow section conference, which was held earlier this year on February 12. Uh, Dr. Beswick is a radiology resident at Henry Ford Hospital, and his research project is titled Culture Positivity Rate for Bone Biopsy of the Foot. Welcome, Zachary. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Uh, give me a chance to just try and share my screen here. All right, you guys are able to uh, see the screen and hear me all right? Yes. All right, perfect. Uh, so my, my uh, project is on uh, culture positivity rate um, for bone biopsy of the foot, um, performed with some of my 
uh, co-residents at Henry Ford and some of our uh, musculoskeletal staff uh, radiologists. Uh, so no financial uh, disclosures for the presentation. So the goals are to discuss osteomyelitis and uh, present our uh, data on culture positivity rates at our institution among dis different uh, patient groups um, and demonstrate the influence that those uh, culture results have in modifying antibiotic treatment. So targeted toward MSK radiologists, orthopedic surgeons, and ID doctors. A little bit of background on osteomyelitis, obviously infection of the bone, commonly related to diabetes with diabetic neuropathy, uh, decreasing a patient's ability to sense uh, pressure or trauma uh, with associated skin breakdown, and then diabetic vasculopathy impairing the body's uh, normal mechanisms to deal with uh, superficial soft tissue infections. This can obviously also happen in patients with peripheral vascular disease or decubitus ulcers without the diabetes. So typically presents with pain, swelling, fever, chills, uh, commonly with erythema and ulceration in the lower extremity. Uh, often, uh, you know, suspected clinically with uh, ability to probe to the bony surface being uh, very suggestive of the, di the diagnosis. Um, radiographs uh, can support the diagnosis, but there's a little bit of a delay um, in, uh, you know, before those findings are radiographically apparent. Um, MR is more sensitive and specific and allows for earlier detection. Uh, but the diagnostic gold standard is still a microbio analysis of a, of a culture specimen. So in general, uh, bone biopsies um, looking for osteomyelitis should be performed before initiation of antibiotic therapy. Um, for a number of reasons, this might not be feasible, um, but is important um, in increasing the yield of biopsy in identifying uh, a pathogen and its susceptibilities. This might not be necessary if there's other cultures that identify the likely pathogen, be it uh, deep tissue culture, uh, positive blood culture, or you know, surgical debridement where tissue would be available, or if it's a case of uh, relapsed osteomyelitis where there's a suspected organism already. Treatments commonly medical and surgical um, with surgical debridement, clearing necrotic and poorly perfused tissue, and then medical treatment with antibiotics uh, for four to six weeks to help clear the infection. Uh, typically, patients are started on broad antibiotic therapies uh, with you know, antibiotics like vancomycin, third generation cephalosporin, or beta-lactam, beta-lactam ACE inhibitor combinations. Um, and then this antibiotic coverage is, is hopefully narrowed depending on the isolated organism. So uh, kind of the, the setting in which we decided to take a look at this data was uh, that uh, the general feeling around the MSK department was that our bone biopsies were probably pretty low yield, um, particularly due to the number of patients who we were biopsying after they had been initiated on antibiotic therapy. Um, so I just was chatting with uh, staff about this just a couple of days ago, and he kind of quoted that prior to, to doing this project and looking at some of this data, that his expectation would have been that maybe our culture results changed you know, management in maybe 2% of patients. So we were, uh, folks were thinking that the, the utility, at least at our institution, was quite low. So we looked over 242 consecutive bone biopsies of the foot, um, and looked at the effect of prior antibiotic administration on culture positivity and how those cultures affected uh, management. We looked over EMR records for those patients. About 73% of the patients were diabetic, 27% were not. And then up to 64% had been on antibiotics prior to biopsy. Uh, patients' ages ranged pretty widely, uh, kind of centered around 58 years old and all had radiographic or MRI findings that suggested the diagnosis. The biopsies were performed under fluoroscopic guidance using one or more passes of an osteocut needle um, into the suspected area of infection um, with more passes as needed for adequate bone core. So among uh, these biopsies, 24% of the cultures uh, came back with positive organism growth. Uh, about 70% of those were gram positive, 15% gram negative. Another 14% were mixed, and there was one fungal. The, the bacteria that were isolated um, kind of were a, a number across the, across the full spectrum. So in terms of the antibiotics that folks were given beforehand, uh, we found among the 64% who had gotten antibiotics, there was a mean of four days and a median of two days um, of antibiotic cessation prior to biopsy. We pretty routinely recommend cessation for kind of as long as we can get um, prior to biopsy. 
Um, but we frequently have issues as patients are uh, usually given antibiotics in the ER um, prior to being admitted to the hospital. So they get a dose or two in the ER and then are subsequently stopped either by the teams on the floor or uh, you know, after consulting with us where we kind of give them our recommendation um, for you know, getting a, a high yield biopsy. Um, commonly these patients are on kind of expected antibiotics, broad spectrum, vancomycin, cefepime, and metronidazole. Um, and then uh, looking at our positivity rates, we did not see any significant difference in the rate of positivity between patients who had received antibiotics prior to biopsy um, and, and those who had not received any. So rates were kind of in the mid to lower 20s uh, for both groups with a p-value of 0.4. Um, we, didn't also, we, did, we also did not see any significant difference in the rate of culture positivity between diabetic and non-diabetic patients, still culture rates in kind of the low 20s with a p-value of 0.5. Um, the, probably the most interesting point that we found was our antibiotic treatments were adjusted you know, based on our you know, biopsy results in 17% of the patients, which, which sounds fairly low, but uh, our, our anticipation prior to doing the project would that you know, it would be somewhere in maybe the single digit percent. Um, you know, like I said, one of the staff quoted me 2%, um, but uh, the thought from everybody was that it would be significantly lower than that. Um, so among those patients who had positive cultures, teams uh, modified therapy in 71% of the patients uh, and no antibiotic therapy change in the patients with no culture growth. They kept those folks on, on broad spectrum antibiotics. So overall rates of, of growth were higher than expected among kind of all groups of patients um, with, um, you know, with particular interest to that kind of 17% uh, that had the change in antibiotic uh, therapy. Um, it was, uh, like the second point here says, it was somewhat unexpected, largely based on kind of what we thought was a large amount of patients we were biopsying who had been on antibiotics at some point in the, in the days leading up to biopsy. Um, so it still is an issue getting, uh, getting biopsies at our institution on patients who haven't been on antibiotics recently, um, largely due to patients getting antibiotics in the, in the ER. Um, so we still recommend cessation of biopsy, but it does give us some uh, you know, peace of mind knowing that it, it, it still does have use even in these patients who are on antibiotics for a couple of days prior to, prior to cessation uh, before biopsy. Um, so although kind of microbioanalysis of a, of a culture specimen, biopsy specimen is the gold standard in diagnosis, it's kind of a limited utility compared to MR given that only you know, around 25% of biopsies demonstrate this positive growth. Um, but uh, in those, in those uh, biopsies where there was positive growth, it did play a, a sizable role in uh, targeting the cause of origin, organism and narrowing down uh, antibiotic, uh, antibiotic therapy. Um, so we'll likely continue going forward um, uh, to kind of help us identify uh, causative organisms and allow our teams to narrow antibiotic coverage, especially in the setting of, uh, you know, current antibiotic stewardship guidelines and uh, multidrug resistant bacteria. That's, that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Zach, for that great presentation. And congratulations on being an abstract winner. Uh, we'll take any questions for uh, Zach, if there are any. I'm looking through the chat lines here, and I don't see any questions. So, OK, so we'll move on to our next uh, uh, research presenter. And uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Anna Lucius, who's a radiation oncology resident from University of Michigan. And her research project is titled Lower Baseline Apparent Diffusion Coefficient Values Associated with Poor Prognosis in Locally Advanced Pancreatic Cancer. Welcome, Anna. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to present this work. Um, one moment, let me just share my screen here. OK. So hopefully that's working. And then. Let's go to slideshow. Okay. And then actually let me swap displays. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see um, my presentation. Um, so thank you again for the opportunity to present um, my work. I'm very grateful to this team at the University of Michigan 
um, to both the departments of radiology as well as radiation oncology um, and biostatistics for help with this work. I have no disclosures. And so this is an outline of what I'll be um, talking about in this presentation and happy to take questions at the end. So as a bit of background, um, the adequate tumor tissue to personalize uh, therapy for pancreatic ca cancer patients is often very difficult to obtain um, just due to the location of um, pan pancreatic cancer. It's typically right near the duodenum and other um, structures. And really personalizing cancer care is the holy grail in what we do as oncologists. Um, and so the role of radiology in this, I think, is, is tantamount. So diffusion MRI um, is the form of functional imaging that provides information beyond just anatomy that can help with um, telling us more about tumor biology as well as potential um, predictions of responsiveness to therapy. And um, apparent diffusion coefficient or ADC maps in particular uh, are very helpful for quantifying this where um, darker or more hypo-intense regions such as the area circled here on the image, uh, which is a pancreatic tumor, um, indicates more restricted diffusion. And this is in stark comparison to areas of fluid that we see like these simple kidney cysts as well as the CSF fluid, which are brighter. And so this will be a theme that comes up um, throughout this presentation. So the goal of our study was to prospectively investigate the relationship between diffusion MRI characteristics, specifically ADC values, and outcomes after chemoradiation in locally advanced pancreatic cancer patients. A few helpful definitions for this presentation. So ADC, as we've gone over, apparent diffusion coefficient. OS refers to overall survival. PFS, progression-free survival. RT, radiation therapy. And CI, confidence interval. Um, so for our methods, uh, this was actually an IRB-approved prospective clinical trial. Diffusion MRIs were obtained in the tumor plane at multiple time points, including both pre- and mid-treatment. Pancreatic tumors were delineated on both T2-weighted as well as diffusion MRI scans by several radiation oncologists. And we also collected CA199 tumor marker labs, which um, have been shown to be a biomarker for pancreatic cancer. Our statistical methods included um, comparing baseline and mid-treatment apparent diffusion coefficient values and with clinical outcomes, which included the following time to local failure, time to distant failure, uh, progression-free survival, overall survival, and we also use Cox proportional hazards for analysis. Just in case um, you weren't aware, so local failure refers to recurrence within the pancreas itself, whereas distant failure typically refers to metastatic spread. So in total, uh, we collected 23 MRI scans in nine patients who received gemcitabine-based chemoradiation, which were six male and three female patients. Um, median age is 64 years, which is typical for pancreatic cancer, range of 52 to 73 years. Um, median progression-free survival of 18 months and median overall survival of 23, I'm sorry, 25.3 months from the time of diagnosis. So actually pretty good for pancreatic cancer especially locally advanced pancreatic cancer. These are some examples of the images that were obtained. So as you can see on the left side of the screen, outlined in green is the tumor on a T2 weighted image. So we see fluid is bright like those kidney cysts and CSF. And then on the right is that same image I had shown before, which is the apparent diffusion coefficient or ADC map, where we can see clearly that tumor that's delineated uh, on the T2 weighted image is clearly diffusion restricted and darker um, on the ADC map. And so this is actually representative of patient number three who had a median um, baseline ADC value of about 1674 and a max baseline ADC of 4108. And so I uh, stated those numbers because as we can see um, for this particular patient, these are their baseline volume corrected um, ADC histogram in blue, and then in red is the mid-treatment, uh, which actually shows an increase in ADC, which actually makes sense, right? So with ADC, we expect lower values to be more restricted diffusion and greater values to be less restricted diffusion. With treatment, there's typically more edema, maybe tumor necrosis, things like this will typically um, result in less restricted diffusion. So it makes sense here, this patient's pattern. Um, when we think about um, the helpfulness of ADC relative to other known biomarkers 
such as CA199. For this particular patient, interestingly, their CA199 lab value was exactly 1.0 at baseline and at four months. And so, you know, that's not very helpful. Whereas the ADC was actually very helpful, right? It shows a pattern that we can track over time. And you can imagine maybe even with more time as the tumor responds, you could use ADC as a non-invasive biomarker. Uh, and so um, just in terms of our imaging results, so we collected um, baseline MRIs, a median of 25 days, range one to 35 prior to radiation. And we found significant associations between lower baseline ADC values indicating more restricted diffusion and poor prognostic factors, lower overall survival, lower progression-free survival, shorter time to local failure, and shorter time to distant failure. Um, these are our results in table form. So as you can see, the values highlighted in red, those were all the, the significant um, factors, um, overall survival, all the way to time to distant failure, you know, all very significant, and with fairly low hazard ratios as well, meaning a fairly large effect size. And this is you know, quite curious. Um, there were only nine patients on this study, but we still found you know, very significant values. Um, on the contrast, right, CA199, as well as the mid-treatment radiation um, ADC values were actually not very helpful. So really the baseline ADC, which may suggest you know, intrinsic um, ra uh, you know, radiation um, independent features of the tumor, you know, the intrinsic biology uh, is most helpful here. And so, yeah, again, the you know, TTLF, the time to local failure, um, and these were shorter uh, in the patients who had lower baseline ADCs. Um, and it, again, sort of representing the data in bar chart form. So here we see that compared to patients who had local failure and no local failure, those who had local failure had lower baseline ADC values. Again, consistent with this narrative that those who have lower baseline ADCs have more diffusion restriction, maybe more aggressive tumors at baseline. And this is statistically significant in our cohort. Similarly, and you can see here even more so, we looked at the difference between baseline and mid-treatment ADC values. So just like our patient three had an increase in the ADC and mid-treatment indicating a response to treatment perhaps, those who had some degree of response had no distant failure. Whereas those who had maybe even a reversal of ADC going towards even more restricted diffusion after treatment, those did have distant failure. And so again, um, I think ADC is a very interesting value that can help us with not only telling us about the intrinsic biology of the tumor, but also helping determine the prediction of how they're going to respond to treatment. Um, in comparison, right, CA199, although it has been shown to be a valuable biomarker, here not so much. You can see they're pretty much overlapping curves. CA199 is essentially the exact same. It's not statistically significant not helpful for prediction of distant failure or local failure. Um, so in conclusion, um, lower, we found that lower baseline ADC values significantly correlated with poor prognostic clinical outcomes in locally advanced pancreatic cancer patients, whereas CD199 tumor marker lab values did not significantly correlate with any clinical outcome. Our work is concordant with prior studies from our group showing that poor pathological responses were found in patients with resectable pancreatic cancer where they actually obtained the surgical specimens and they found that those had lower baseline ADC values. And so further investigation is needed to study this non-invasive imaging biomarker for clinical decision. Um, thank you so much and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Anna, for that wonderful talk there. Um, looking at the chat line, I don't see any questions here. So uh, thank you again, and, and congratulations again on being an abstract winner. Thank you. OK, uh, now on to our final part of our evening with our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Gregory Nicola. Uh, artificial intelligence is one of the hottest topics around, not just today, but for several years now. You really can't open your email or radiology journal without seeing some emerging new technology related to machine learning, deep learning, or artificial intelligence. I just learned the other day uh, from the ACR Data Science Institute, there are already over 100 FDA cleared artificial intelligence algorithms. These FDA approved algorithms are already being used in applications ranging from breast imaging, to imaging of the brain, 
lungs, heart, and prostate, and the list continues to grow. Artificial intelligence is not going anywhere and it is here to stay. We need to embrace it and learn how to incorporate it into our daily practice and use it to help identify lesions, optimize our workflow, and most of all, to improve patient health care. But one of the biggest barriers to widespread adoption of new technology is cost. Is my radiology group or is my hospital's investment into AI software going to eventually pay for itself and more importantly, generate additional income? The economics of artificial intelligence is a very, very interesting topic. And we are very fortunate enough to have Dr. Gregor Nicola, ACR Chair of Economics with us tonight. For those of you that do not know Dr. Nicola, he's a practicing neuroradiologist. He currently serves as the executive leader of the Hackensack Radiology Group in Hackensack, New Jersey, as well as a board member and finance chair for the Hackensack Meridian Health Partners Clinically Integrated Network. Dr. Nicola is a leader in the radiology community, specifically in regards to health policy and economic issues, and currently serves as chair of the ACR Commission on Economics. He is also a member of the ACR Board of Chancellors. He is also the past ASNR advisor to the AMA RUC and past two-time participant of the CMS Acumen Resource Use Measure Committee. Aside from his leadership roles, he has authored and co-authored numerous peer-related reviewed articles pertaining to health policy and economics and serves as a frequent speaker at national medical conferences. Dr. Nicola will be talking to us tonight about the economics of artificial intelligence. Welcome, Dr. Nicola. Thank you, Danny, and uh, thanks to your whole state chapter. I lived in Michigan during my college years. I wish I was there in person. It'd be, it's been a long time since I've been there. Um, and thanks to my friends in the audience. I know quite a few of you. I'm going to share my screen, and this is it here. Wonderful. I, I assume everyone's seeing my screen now. OK, so I want to start off qualifying this lecture in that every single specialty in medicine is facing these challenges. So yes, I'm speaking from a radiologic centric viewpoint, but I don't want to cause mass paranoia because there's some disruption here. Technology disrupts, and that's what it does. Um, so the key point here is that everybody in medicine is going to be dealing with this. Not only that, every market sector is going to be dealing with the impact of computer, computer artificial intelligence. I do have one disclosure I just want to point out. I am a chief medical officer of an artificial intelligence company. It is not in the radiology space. It's in the health space. It's machine, um, it's wearable medical devices and predicting exacerbation of um, chronic diseases. Um, but I just want to disclose it since it's an artificial intelligence talk. I also have some, some consulting roles in radiology with a specific company guide point. I want to start off by setting the stage with a thought experiment here. Um, what you see on the screen is the Gutenberg printing press. And I think that there is probably no better example of disruption than the concept of printing press. And I want to do my due diligence to history. By no means was the Gutenberg actually probably the first mechanism of block printing. There's reports from China that it was invented hundreds of years earlier, even in the Middle East, um, the exact locations indeterminate, but the economic impact on Europe by the Gutenberg printing press is well documented. And I wanna stick with that thought experiment. Prior to the in advent of the Gutenberg, the only way written documents got reproduced was by scribes. It was handwritten. They could do maybe 40 pages a day. And you could imagine by the 40th page, their hands were cramped and the handwriting was pretty poor. Introduced the Gutenberg around 1400 AD. And all of a sudden, one operator could do 400 pages, a tenfold increase in productivity. And you can imagine, since it was block printing, the last page was equivalent quality to the first page. March forward a little bit to the end of Renaissance, and we have an operator doing 4,000 pages a day. That's disruption. So let's think about this in terms of the value equation. We see this redundant, but I, I find it very helpful to think through this. Prior to the advent of the Gutenberg, we have a scribe 
pretty costly, only doing 40 pages a day, pretty lousy quality. The value of printed material wasn't that great. In fact, it was pretty much just used in the religious organizations of Europe. Um, and in fact, most of the scribes were monks um, reproducing biblical texts. Um, there wasn't a demand in Europe for printed material. Introduced to Gutenberg, and by the end of the Renaissance, we have artists producing books, we have people marketing their businesses with printed material, and we had an explosion. And it's really easy to think why. The cost of producing 4,000 pages was way cheaper than 40, and the quality was magnificent, and the value exploded, and hence the demand followed. And we had an explosion of learning and reading and all sorts of artistic expression. The question for you is, does healthcare have such a easy economic um, paradigm to follow. Um, for example, you know, in the printing press, there was somebody who needed printing goods as a, they were the consumer. They had money to spend to meet that need. They purchased it from a specific person or entity and they got back what they needed. Um, let's just look at this photo and touch on how complex healthcare is. We have a patient in the background getting a CT scanner. Let's say that's a radiologist in the foreground reading the images. Um, who, what is the service here? It's the, the CAT scan. Was the consumer the patient? Well, probably not. It was probably the referring doctor who needed the CAT scan to make a clinical decision. Um, who's paying? Well, the patient pays for sure, but often indirectly, maybe through a deductible, maybe through a health insurance premium that they pay every month. Um, but the money doesn't really leave the patient's pocket in a fashion that's per widget. It leaves it in kind of a monthly fashion. Um, so, you know, the payment paradigm, who's the consumer is a little bit blurred. Well, what's the product here? Well, in, in our healthcare system, there are many payments made for this specific CAT scan. So for example, there's a payment to the facility that owns the CAT scanner. That could be the hospital. It could be a physician group. It's paid to pay for the technical cost of the equipment and the staff to run that equipment. There's also a payment for the interpretation of the medical imaging. Believe it or not, there's a payment to the ordering doctor who wants the image. They can upcode their evaluation and management service or office visit because they're ordering images. So you can see there's also payment to malpractice for paying for liability. Um, so even the consumer, if it was the patient here, I don't think they have any idea of how many things they just purchased just to get a simple CAT scanner. So this is a very complex paradigm. Now overlay artificial intelligence. Who's the consumer there? Um, it's very complex. Is it the hospital? Is it the physician group? Is it the patient? Is it the insurance carrier? And the answer to that is probably all of those. It's whoever deems the most value for that specific application is likely to be the consumer. So I wanna dive into the largest payer in the United States on how they've thought about artificial intelligence and how they're trying to tackle paying for this technology. And that's the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, our largest healthcare payer. How Medicare pays for clinical services is really through three broad payment paradigms. The first is the Medicare physician fee schedule. This is a part B allocation that pays for all physician and clinician services. It doesn't matter if this is an inpatient service or outpatient service. This is how clinicians get paid. It doesn't matter if you're employed or if you're not employed. For the most part, your university or practice is getting paid through the Part B Medicare physician fee schedule for your services. There's also a hospital outpatient perspective payment system. This is paying the hospital owned imaging center for their equipment. They're paying a technical component for the hospital equipment. And then finally, there's an inpatient perspective payment system, and that is paying for inpatient services, not inpatient clinician services, which is paid through the Medicare physician fee schedule, but the cost of operating room time and the cost of a ICU unit bed and the nursing staff. So it's paying for those type of resources. What's important to understand is that under each of these payment pathways is a coding structure that allows the specific entity to bill Medicare. And in the physician fee schedule, that's called a CPT, which is a current procedure terminology. It's a CPT code. In the outpatient perspective payment system, it's a hex pix code uh, to, to be to shorten up the clutter on this. Um, it's, there's also CPT coding, 
and they're bundled into something called ambulatory payment classifications, which are kind of buckets of imaging as opposed to widgets of imaging. And finally, in the inpatient perspective payment system, it's something called the diagnosis related group. That's a bundle of the entire episode of care for a patient. So if you are admitted for stroke, you don't get paid for every little service you received by the hospital. You get paid one bucket of money by Medicare in a lump sum. It's a bundle called the DRG. Now, interestingly, using this standard structure, we've only seen one single artificial intelligence application navigate this current structure. And that is um, this year, Medicare is paying both through the physician fee schedule and the hospital patient perspective payment system for an artificial intelligence application dealing with imaging of the retina for diabetic retinopathy. Um, this service has a CPT code. And what's kind of interesting about this is you think this would be used by ophthalmologists, but it's not. This is used by primary care doctors. And one of the selling points to get this as a code was it was gonna expand the access for patients to be screened for diabetic retinopathy out of the small niche of ophthalmologists who were skilled in doing it and into the primary care offices. And now when someone receives these retina scans in a primary care doctor's office, they can be referred to an ophthalmologist for more definitive therapy or definitive diagnosis. But this is the currently the only fee-for-service CPT code created for artificial intelligence. Now, probably most of you think, well, that's not true. There's other ways that artificial intelligence is being paid. And you're absolutely right, there is. And we'll go into those and it's much more complex. So for example, uh, Medicare for a long time has something called a new technology add-on payment. This was uh, made really several decades ago because there was a fear Medicare patients weren't gonna have cutting edge technology applied to their care. So Medicare is a payment pathway to pay for these cutting edge technology. It's called an NTAP, new technology add-on payment. So if we overlay NTAP into this complex equation, the only places you see NTAP are hospital payments. You will see it in the hospital outpatient perspective payment system. You'll also see it in the inpatient perspective payment system. And we do have several artificial intelligence or even advanced analytics software packages specific to radiology now being paid this way. So for example, in the HOPS schedule, we have FFR fractional flow reserve, for coronary CTA to determine, um, uh, to help further an analyze a stenosis on coronary CTA. Um, inside the DRG or the inpatient perspective payment system, we recently saw, and this had a lot of press, the payment for large vessel occlusion and communication using advanced analytics, artificial intelligence applications. It was specifically one vendor, but it was extrapolated to many vendors that can do this. And this is for stroke and, and um, um, embolism detection. Now, how an NTAP works is way beyond the discussion here. We have written extensively uh, in the peer review literature and also several bulletin articles about this, but it's not quite a fee-for-service payment. There's all sorts of caps and safeguards on how they pay these out. And I'm, I'm not gonna go into that today. Now, that's actually, we're not done on other ways Medicare can pay for artificial intelligence technology. There's actually a fairly new one, which, was implemented under the former President, President Trump's executive order from 2019 to further advance care provided by Medicare patients. There's something called Medicare Coverage of Innovative Technology, MKIT. MKIT's fascinating in that the rules were just actually written in January. And basically what they state is that as soon as you get breakthrough technology clearance by the FDA, you're eligible for this payment. And we think the MKIT's gonna to apply to all three payment pathways. And I have heard and haven't had it validated. I've heard from at least one vendor recently in radiology that they have MKIT payments coming to them soon for ultrasound and artificial intelligence applications in breast and thyroid. Um, so we are gonna see payments now really starting to trickle through radiology. Now, what's kind of fascinating about this is it still makes you wonder why there aren't traditional pathways. Everyone seems to be going through MKIT or NTAP. Um, why is that? Because I'll tell you, there's a limitation to MKIT and NTAP in that they're time limited. For example, new technology add-on payment is only a three-year payment. And then you really have to find some way else to get paid. The same thing with MKIT, it's a four-year payment. And you eventually either have to find a way to get paid through a DRG 
a CPT, APC, HCPS, or CPT code. Um, the problem is that that's not an easy process. The CPT coding process is managed by the American Medical Association. They convene a panel of experts three times a year to look at new and revised CPT codes. That panel consists of clinicians, insurance executives, and Medicare representatives. And they're pretty cautious about allowing payments for services that appear redundant. And what do I mean by that? Let's say we could come up, and there are already artificial intelligence applications for detecting intracranial hemorrhage. Now, if that went through the CPT editorial panel, they would simply say, and by the way, they've already said this to us, that that's already captured in the head CT professional interpretation code. A radiologist is already looking for hemorrhage. We're not gonna pay for an algorithm to look for hemorrhage, that's redundant. Now that is very concerning for us in many ways. One is that we can't necessarily bring forward technology that's gonna help us in our day-to-day -day practice in a fee-for-service environment. But what's concerning is their track record on what CPT code they have approved. And that is one that ophthalmologists also do, the retina, um, scanner, which I've talked about for diabetic retinopathy, the reason they approved that is because it displaced screening for diabetic retinopathy out of the ophthalmologist's hands and into the primary care doctor hands, increasing access to care. So that's not a great paradigm for any specialist because we really don't love artificial intelligence applications supporting other people doing imaging. Um, the other barrier here um, to, to CPT coding is, uh, is, is what we'll go through in just a little bit when we get to payment policy. Um, CPT coding structure is more complex than it first appears. There's actually three different categories of CPT codes. The one we usually accept and talk about is the um, common CPT category one codes. And that, that's pretty much your day-to-day -day practice. When you read a head CT or perform a head CT or an ultrasound or a breast biopsy, those all have standard category one codes. You submit to Medicare or the commercial payers and you'll get a payment for. Um, category three codes are somewhat like category one codes. They could represent a fee for service payment. Um, the problem is most carriers um, do not pay for them. You could negotiate um, local co coverage determinations or carrier pricing with the insurance companies, but typically they're not paid for. And the main reason is because they're often emerging technologies that there's not a lot of data behind. There's not a lot of uptake by um, community practices to really start paying it in a robust fashion, but it's worthy of creating a code in that you can track and prove that the community is starting to use it and then Medicare would consider moving it to a category one. You can see artificial intelligence applications jumping right to category one currently if they meet the specific standards of having widespread use and have the literature. Um, we see more vendors coming to us to create category three codes which we are now currently doing. In fact, we potentially have a successful category three code created. Um, it won't be available for payment, but at least we can start tracking what's going on in the broader house of medicine. Category two codes happen to be quite different in that they're really markers for uh, quality measures. Theoretically, there's also a payment pathway for category two codes in artificial intelligence applications. It's just much more nebulous than a fee-for-service payment in that um, there are performance programs that pay somebody for optimizing performance measures and it's called value-based payments. Um, so if an artificial intelligence application help you provide higher quality patient care and that was measurable through a value-based measurement, you could get a value-based payment measurement um, payment at the end. And I haven't seen artificial intelligence applications go this route yet, namely because it's a much more nebulous payment. But I actually think that there is a robust pathway forward there. It's just time consuming and, and may take some time for that type of adoption. So why is CPT codes important? Well, it happens that it gets plugged into an equation and it basically determines how Medicare pays you. So every single CPT code we bill has an assigned relative value unit towards it. That relative value unit serves as a fudge factor that's multiplied by a conversion factor, which is the $34 you see on the right side of the screen. That's the current conversion factor Medicare pays per RBU. And that will determine the payment you get for Medicare for the specific service. The other important part about this equation 
is if you took every single RVU build in that calendar year and multiplied it by that conversion factor, the $34, it comes up with a large number of everything Medicare is paying the physicians and fee schedule. Well, that large number is subject to regulatory and statutory budget neutrality requirements, meaning it always has to be the same. So what that means is the RVUs, the total RVUs in the system go up, Medicare is going to have to adjust the conversion factor down. If the RVUs go down, Medicare adjusts the conversion factor up in order to maintain that budget neutrality. That's a very important point because it's nuanced, but it's important on how and one reason why it's so hard to push CPT codes through. And I'm going to go through that now because the RVUs are not created by the CPT editorial panel. They're created by a separate panel also convened by the American Medical Association called the Relative Value Update Committee, the RUC, of which I was an advisor to for about a decade. The RUC is not super collegial. It's actually more like a rugby scrum. And the reason is because of that budget neutrality equation I just showed you. You can imagine if a specialty brought forward a ton of artificial intelligence applications for new payment. And that means more RBUs are going to be given to that specialty. And the RUC does not like that because it's a bunch of doctors fighting for every dollar they can in their specialty. Well, how the RUC manages this is you cannot bring forward an isolated CPT code. So let's say we were able to get a hemorrhage detection AI algorithm CPT code for head CT brought forward to CPT and then brought forward to the RUC. The RUC would not value that code without bringing forward the entire head CT family. Why is that? Because they're gonna look for savings inside our own codes, not throughout the rest of medicine. So this is the conundrum we're dealing with when we're talking about artificial intelligence payment. It's way more nuanced and complex. And one of the reasons we haven't seen a lot of movement in the CPT world, and we've seen these run around temporary programs paying for these applications. Now, Let's take a look at RVUs. And of course, nothing is as simple as you wish. There was three categories of CPT codes. Turns out there's three categories of RVU. There's a payment um, for malpractice that we all get every time we bill any service. There's a payment for professional services that you provide. And if you own the technical equipment that was used to provide the professional service, you get paid for a technical service. And there's actually RVUs for each one of these. I would argue Artificial intelligence applications potentially affect the RBUs in all three of these categories. For example, if you look on the far right of the screen, certainly if you have an algorithm detecting pulmonary nodules and preventing the liability of a pulmonary nodule mishap or at least reducing the liability, um, Medicare may be inclined to pay you slightly less for malpractice. Now, the RBUs for professional and technical have a more complex equation that the RUC looks at. These are basically um, time-driven, um, activity-based costing type algorithms um, where time and resource allocation is extremely important to come up with the RBUs. And when you go to one of these RUC meetings, we actually sit with spreadsheets looking at what kind of resources you use. And, and, and just to, not to go too far off topic, I'll never forget the psychiatrist presenting psychoanalysis in front of the RUC for the technical component, the payment for their office supplies. And there was actually an argument at the table over whether the patients typically have five or six Kleenex used during um, psychotherapy. And that, that is a true story. And it was a, a, a debate for a few seconds on whether they give the psychiatrist one extra Kleenex. Um, that's how nuanced and crazy this process is. Anyways, you can imagine artificial intelligence applications also putting downward pressures on these types of RBUs. If the time to acquire an MRI goes down because of interesting artificial intelligence applications, or perhaps the resources go down where you're able to run several machines more seamlessly with less staff or even less machines. Um, you can also see that in the professional side. If the time to interpret a CT of the chest goes down, um, then that will lead to downward pressure on RBUs. Um, also, if the intensity of the work goes down because you have a work list organizer that's bringing urgent cases to your attention and getting those off your plate in a more easier fashion. Those all can affect how we, um, this, there's nuanced discussions around the rough table and those affect all our arguments on reimbursement. 
So it sounds like artificial intelligence applications really are going to put some downward pressure on those RVUs for numerous reasons. But that brings me back to how we started this discussion, and that's the printing press. Um, does this sound familiar? We're more productive, and also our quality of work goes up. We're missing less. Well, well, that's the printing press argument, right? Isn't it? I mean, minus the complexities of payment, it sounds very similar. So let's let's do the same thought experiment here. You now have radiologists um, more productive, but they're being paid less per widget because they're getting less for a head CD or less for chest CD. Maybe they're getting through more to make that up, but maybe not. So the, the, the payment per service is lower, but the quality is higher. What does that mean? It means our value explodes. Not only the value of the radiologist, the value of imaging explodes. But here's where the thought experiment really may take a turn from what happens in the printing press. In the printing press example, there was enormous demand for printed materials. Is there enormous pent up demand for imaging? I would argue imaging is used pretty robustly in the United States. Perhaps what we already know from statistics, it's used often twice as much as other industrialized countries. Is there really a pent up demand for imaging that's not being met? Maybe, maybe not. Um, it really is gonna depend on where our specialty goes. We need to create this demand in a way that improves outcomes. So with the lower costs of a CAT scanner, and perhaps even lower radiation dose or more applications of MR and making it quicker, can we start expanding our ability to screen for numerous diseases, whether it's chronic disease, um, heart disease, cancers? Do we move into that space and actually prove that they are value added in screening? We all know screening is a complex paradigm and very difficult to move in, but possibly with reduced costs and higher quality care through imaging, we can move and expand our reach. Um, do we learn to manage our incidental findings in a way that's cost effective? Do we have ways with new data science tools to prove our effectiveness on outcomes? Those are all things that could explode our demand and then keep us all in operation, just like the printing press operators were employed even more than the scrubs. But there's a lot of ifs in that equation for sure. So let's march further forward. Now let's jump forward 600 years and talk about what's happened to the standard printing operations of just standard printing every day. Well, um, you really don't need printing press operators anymore, right? We all go to the copy machine and do our own copies. Um, there is a democratization of, of what you're doing with technology. That's the, in essence, what disruption is. It will democratize what you do and bring it out of the specialist's hands and into the generalist's hands. Yes, that's alarming. It happens in every specialty. The ones that succeed are the ones that adapt to the new normal. There's gonna be more data for us to analyze. There's gonna be more things to do as more data starts flowing. And we all will have to adapt, whether you're an internist, a surgeon, or a radiologist. Let's face it, there actually still are printing press operators and we are 600 years now um, since the advent of the printing press. Um, they're highly specialized using highly, highly technical equipment that really we couldn't use in our own home as a copy machine. Um, they're there for things that people couldn't have imagined 600 years ago to print. And I fully suspect that will happen in the house of medicine. I have confidence it will happen in radiology with the advent of new technology and new analytics tools. Um, we will have radiologists just like we have printing press operators. The degree and size of the radiology workforce is completely indeterminate for lots of factors. And a lot of factors have to do with us ourselves on us providing value to the healthcare system. So I, that is my last slide. Um, I'm happy to take questions in regards to this talk, but as economics chair of the American College of Radiology, I'm also happy to take any question that you have on your mind about the economics of radiology, whether it's the recent evaluation and management service codes potentially impacting radiology payments, to anything dealing with decision support, the broad spectrum. I'm happy to answer questions as the representatives from the college. Um, so thank you all for your time. Thank you, Dr. Nicola, for that enlightening talk. I learned uh, new, some new things about AI and, and reimbursement there. Uh, looks like we do have some questions uh, here from our audience. Uh, I'll start with the uh, first one here. Um, what is a good source for information on AI? 
um, on economics of AI or AI in general? It's a broad question. I'll, I'll try to answer several aspects of it. Um, I, I think that, the, first of all, the American College of Radiology does have a data science institute, and there are lots of tools online that allow practicing radiologists or residents or, or, or fellows to go online and fool with some of the artificial intelligence applications tools. Now, I, I have a lot of background in artificial intelligence beyond just the economics because of my chief medical officer position, and I, I know quite about bit about the technology. I will tell you that there is a large amount of data smoothing um, um, and aggregating data, um, and I, I don't have a ton of faith in the current applications on the market, even the ones that are FDA approved. Uh, I think radiologists are going to really have to monitor these algorithms in the real world. Um, they are biased. They are brittle, um, and I don't think we're in an era yet where there's a lot of autonomy. And uh, I, I think that um, you have to trial and error and get yourself educated on all these downfalls and pitfalls of the applications before you start using them. And the DSI website from the ACR does a decent job of start introducing this. As far as the economic scope, this is a moving target. It literally changes every couple months. I mean, the end kit was just um, the regulation was just published in January. Um, so this is a fast moving target. Um, we did write, uh, I think it was just made it online maybe yesterday in radiology, the artificial intelligence subset of the radiology journal. We just published yesterday kind of almost an um, um, outline of what you heard in the talk with more detail um, to give you an idea about the um, economics of. So hopefully those provide you a few resources um, that you can start digging into. Okay, we have another question. If there is budget neutrality, would it be better for radiology not to worry about creating CPT codes for AI and look for payment, but instead well, simply use it, pay for it ourselves to increase efficiency of radiologist practices to do more cases, see more patients per day, and thereby increase revenue? Yeah, great question. The problem is the CPT, unlike the RUC, which is closed and it's only to members, CPT process is open to everybody, including vendors. And if a vendor comes forward with a compelling argument for CPT code and we see it, they will get a CPT code and we do not have control of that. Um, so the best we can do is help vendors create codes that we think help radiologists, but that is not our friend and there are vendors that are not our friend and will absolutely move stuff forward and if the panel deems it valuable and sees literature and research behind it, there's nothing we can do. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, currently for radiologists using FDA approved CT bleed software, are CMS professional fees decreased? No, no, currently that is um, that just detecting a hemorrhage that has no CPT code whatsoever. You just bill your standard CPT code for the reading of the head CT and you're paid that widget. And I assume, depending on who paid for the software, if it was your group, then some kind of allocation of money will be used to pay for the software. If it was the hospital that didn't charge your group anything, then great. Or if it was your department, your department's probably paying for it with some type of economic allocation. But it does not come from the specific payment um, made for the interpretation. Okay, next question. Uh... Any thoughts on how we're going to increase our value going forward when AI becomes more broadly used? Well, you know, I, I in the near future, I, I just, um, the most important thing is to make sure we're, we're involved in care pathways as quick as we can. We got to remember that some of this technology is now giving reads at scanner. And, you know, I, I, we, we have, I can tell a personal story to try to put this in perspective. You know, our neurologists now get a, a a message text to them immediately about embolus and hemorrhage and where are we in that care paradigm. But the other night, uh, one of the neurologists ordered a head CT on a patient after anesthesia. And uh, guess what? The, the, they thought it was a stroke and then they called off all the per perfusion and CTA imaging. The next day they did an MRI and I saw a watershed infarct at five o'clock at night and said, they didn't do any vascular imaging. This is alarming. And I called and got vascular imaging done. There was a high-grade stenosis. They treated the patient. The patient was much better. I participated in care there because I thought outside the box, there's no vascular imaging. There's a small volume stroke. 
somebody better do vascular imaging urgently. They, and, you know, you have to think of ways to get yourself involved and you have to start thinking of what did they miss in their care process? Um, because getting, getting results quicker, the computer's gonna do faster. So now you have to cover where are they missing in their care process. I think interacting with clinicians and patients is vital and, and, and providing just first class service whenever they call you and, and having being available for those kind of things is what we can do. And the longer term, the hope is that we start seeing more analytic type artificial intelligence applications instead of, oh, I can find what you find better. Um, so for example, if we have some tools that can help predict pathology or predict long-term outcomes of somebody or somebody who's at risk for an abdominal aortic aneurysm or quantify something like emphysema and being able to predict outcomes or predict therapy, that kind of stuff will be invaluable to the profession and also other clinicians. Um, but I think those are the wins. Um, however, those are huge research projects. Um, they're not as easy as the low hanging fruit we see on the market, which is, you know, I, I found a pulmonary nodule better than you. Um, so it'll be some time before we see the more positive impact of the technology. Okay, we have another question. Uh, for radiologists as printing press operators, what can radiologists do to ensure that they're able to purchase and use future AI algorithms, or will they be effectively shut up by hospitals, insurers, or other large entities that use these tools to steer healthcare resource utilization in a way more favorable to their own interests? Yeah, that's always a fascinating question. And I can literally apply that to anything outside of artificial intelligence too. Um, and I always go back to the importance of having a seat at the table. And, and I, I wouldn't, this is not about radiology. This is just about having a voice. It happens in our political system. It happens in our hospitals. Um, uh, for example, in our system, we were generating huge amounts of shared savings. So our shared savings contracts, hundreds of millions of dollars. and the talk by the executives is, okay, we'll give it back to the primary care doctors and the specialists that see patients because no one else helps save money. And I, I happen to be the finance chair of our clinically grade network. We have 7,000 physicians. I was there and I said, that's not true. This is what I do as a radiologist every day to save money. And I went through a list of things that my practice does. And guess what? Immediately, we had a share of the shared savings. So it's the same concept. If you decide to just sit at home. Nowadays, it's at home. It's not even in the reading room. So you sit at home and hide behind your screen and not talk to anybody and not participate in hospital committees, not better patient care, not sit on quality committees, not sit on value-based metric committees or even transformation committees. That will happen. Somebody will buy it for you and displace you. If you're there at the table, people will hear what you do and see what you do, and you'll get to, you'll get to take part in it. And, and by the way, this, this applies to primary care doesn't, uh, or surgeons. They all, when they're not at the table, I always see them disenfranchised. And the vo your voice is valuable and participating in the hospital environment or in your practice environments, is, is you, you can't beat it. Uh, another question we have is uh, data is money. Who benefits most from the data from CPT codes? The data from CPT code. So CPT, if, if there's data from CPT code, and really there's only two entities that have access to it in a robust fashion. A, it's the AMA, they own it. Uh, and B, Medicare has access to utilization data through Medicare. Um, the commercial payers have utilization data based on CPT codes too, but um, I, I, I don't quite understand the, um, if they're talking about the data from utilization, and that's the main thing you get out of CPT coding. Um, but really they're, those are owned by specific entities. If you're talking about data inside imaging for artificial intelligence, um, what I've found is that the raw data, although this is changing because of the labeling um, sophistication, the raw data is not worth a whole lot. Um, labeled data is worth a lot more. Um, and uh, that means somebody had to participate in that label data and that's radiologist time. Um, so in the future, you know, as for example, our, our organization um, has an artificial intelligence um, applications and imaging through Google Health, um, and we can work with Google creating our own algorithms internally, but we'd have to label everything. So um, we can potentially help ourselves by participating in that process. Um, so it's, there's lots of ways and there's lot, I, the, the concept of data is a big concept. 
Okay, we have a, a longer question here. There's a lot interested in abbreviated breast MRI for screening. Most institutions charge significantly less hundreds for abbreviated MRIs of fee of service uh, versus full price MRI, uh, which often cost thousands. Some radiologists are against the proliferation of abbreviated scanning since it may potentially erode MRI revenues. However, charging less enables us to screen women who can't afford full price scanning. From an economic viewpoint, how should we approach this dilemma? So, so the first, I, I, I hear about this all the time. The, the first thing I want to say is that you have to be very careful you're not violating any commercial payer contracts and violating agreements with Medicare because going below your commercial contracts, if the patient has that specific insurance, can be seen as an inducement of referrals. And so you need to be careful. Now, if this is cash paying patients without insurance, a different story, you can charge whatever you want. Um, in the, if, if it's an insured patient, there are several contractual obligations. You can wiggle out of them and you should just make sure your contract allows you to, but they can be quite tough. Um, and you really should not be charging anything but what the, the price is accepted by the insurance company. Um, with Medicare, you, you also have to be careful doing that. Um, it can also be seen as inducement. It, it can be an OIG offense. Um, and so th that's something you have to be cognizant of unless the patient doesn't have insurance and it's charity care. Um, if it's with Medicare, I will tell you, when you look at the um, descriptors for CPT codes, you can do a one pulse sequence MRI of the brain or a 10 pulse sequence MRI of the brain. And there's nothing in the descriptor that prevents you from billing that exact same code. So there isn't a reason you shouldn't build a full code, you can. Um, and that's the same, the same goes with using a 1.5 or a 0.5 or a three Tesla magnet, you get paid the same for all those. It's just one CPT code that represents all those. Um, so that, you know, that's a, there's some complexity to that topic, but uh, that, that's the, the basically basic summary of it. Okay, looks like we have a few more questions here. Uh, where do you think AI can be helpful to readjust now without being threatening? Well, I, I think that there are some interesting applications out there. For example, um, if you're a practice that's chronically behind on urgent cases and you're getting complaints that there was a, a bleed or a pulmonary embolism you sat on for hours, there's a number of work list triage applications that I think can really help radiologists make sure they're prioritizing, prioritizing cases that could have patient care impact. I think those are really great ideas and, and helpful. Um, now, you know, I'm starting to see literature from some of the AI companies about their detection algorithms, um, preventing long-term complications or reducing possible stay. I, I have some doubt about most of the detection algorithms, especially if um, your radiologists are, are um, for the most part, reading real time. I, I, I'm not a big fan of those, but Mainly the work list organizers I see helpful. Um, and then like really advanced um, applications. Now, fractional flow reserve has some artificial intelligence, I guess, engine behind it, although I think most of it is more quantitative. Um, that clearly gives information um, that we couldn't ascertain on our own. So when we start seeing applications that give us information that we could have never gotten on our own, that's when we're really going to start benefiting from it. Okay. Um, what do you think of likelihood of uh, AI software not being reimbursed and it's seen as a business expense? I think it's very likely. I think um, we're going to see, I, I would probably venture to say most of the detection algorithms that are redundant with what we do, you won't see picked up as an individual widget. Now, if there was an autonomous read of a full head CT, that would be paid for. Um, if it's just a subset of reading a head CT that a radiologist already does, you're not gonna see those paid for, um, I, I don't think. Uh, I'm, I don't have a crystal ball, but I doubt it. And you're gonna to have to use those as a business expense. Okay. Um, what is your advice to a medical student who's thinking of a career uh, in radiology but is afraid of AI and is considering AI in his uh, career decision choice? Uh, I would say don't take a job anywhere in any market sector because if AI is scaring you in radiology, it'll scare you in banking, it'll scare you as a lawyer, it'll scare you as a marketer. It, it just doesn't matter. This is incredible technology. Um, 
and, and me, I saw so I have an entrepreneurial background. I, I, I had started a company years ago with my brother. I'm in another startup. I love disruption. Disruption is the greatest thing on earth. And I hope you all have that attitude because it's exactly how the profession succeeds is look for disruption and then start plugging holes. And it's the, it's the most exciting time in radiology if you have that mentality because it's, you finally get to start plugging holes. And plugging those holes is solving problems and making patient care better. So to me, it's a super exciting field right now. Okay, now we'll take uh, one more question. It's getting uh, late, some 49. So uh, we have uh, AI algorithms uh, currently approved by FDA. Uh, are they buyer beware, question mark? Yeah, I, um, my take, and I don't mean to insult any of the vendors. I speak to them all the time. Um, and, and again, I'm not an artificial intelligence um, specialist in the nitty gritty. I know a lot about the technology, but speaking to people who know a lot more than me, um, there is some serious concerns about the current algorithms that are FDA approved. And I do think they're buyer beware. Um, um, but not necessarily don't buy, but buyer beware and watch. Okay, so that'll be uh, the last uh, question we have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nilka, for your time tonight. It was a wonderful lecture. And you can see by the number of questions we've had, it's a lot of, uh, very interesting topic that uh, everyone's uh, very interested in. Uh, so again, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, thank you to our resident uh, research presenters, uh, Dr. Lucius and Dr. Beswick as well. Uh, I'd also like to give a shout out to our executive director, Shannon Sage, who uh, put together a virtual Hickey lecture uh, this uh, evening. And so this uh, concludes our program for, for the night uh, for our Preston Hickey Memorial Lecture. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Uh, take care and have a good night. Thank you.